Did you know that you're required to know whether or not you have enough runway for takeoffs and landings? In the past, you may have thought this was only required for large airplanes because they need a lot more runway to make a safe takeoff and landing. But I want to show you something from the Federal Aviation Regulations in Section 91103. Each pilot in command shall, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. This information must include runway links at airports of intended use and the following takeoff and landing distance information. For civil aircraft for which an approved airplane or rotorcraft flight manual containing takeoff and landing distance data is required, the takeoff and landing distance contained therein. So according to this, you need to know the length of the runways you're using. And according to this right here, if there is a POH or flight manual for the aircraft, you have to know how much runway you need for takeoff and landing. And if you have a super old airplane that doesn't have a POH or flight manual, you may not have performance tables, but you still have to have a reliable way to tell that you're going to have enough runway. In today's video, I'm going to explain performance calculations in detail. Even if you're familiar with takeoff and landing calculations, you're going to want to watch this video because we're going to be talking about a lot more than takeoffs and landings because the performance of your airplane can affect a bunch of different aspects of flight. Okay, so you want to be able to safely control your airplane. Part of being able to do that is to know its limitations or capabilities. Unlike a car or truck, the capabilities can change a lot when you're flying an airplane for four main reasons. I'm going to discuss each one of these in just a second, but here's a quick memory aid if you want to remember all four of them. Remember the four H's, high, hot, heavy, and humid. Okay, so the first thing that affects the performance of our airplane is high altitude, specifically high pressure altitude. As I've explained in other lessons, there are a bunch of different kinds of altitude. On the average day, or technically what we call the standard day, the pressure at sea level is 29.92 inches of mercury. Then, every thousand feet of altitude that you climb, the pressure decreases one inch of mercury. Now, you and I both know that we almost never have normal weather conditions here on Earth, so the pressure is almost never exactly 29.92 inches when you get the ATIS off the radio. So what we do is we spin a corrected altimeter setting into the altimeter and this gives us an accurate indicated altitude when we're flying. And this allows us to fly safely over the top of stuff and know that we're not going to run into a tower or some other obstacle. But when it comes to performance, the airplane doesn't care about that. What it cares about is how thin the air is or how many air molecules you're flying through. And if we were to leave our altimeter set at 29.92 inches, this would allow us to see exactly how much pressure the outside air was putting on the aircraft. This is what we're calling our pressure altitude. It's a set pressure, and there's always a specific altitude associated with a set pressure. Because remember, the pressure decreases one inch of mercury every thousand feet you climb. Before we continue, I do want to mention that if you're lucky enough to fly on a day when the air pressure is exactly 29.92 inches, your pressure altitude will be exactly the same as your true altitude. And your true altitude is what they use to depict obstacles, mountains, and basically all the altitudes you see on a chart. But the indicated altitude that you see in your airplane is actually going to be slightly different than that, even under standard conditions, and that's because of instrument error. I've discussed that in much more detail in a few other lessons, so if you have questions, be sure to check those videos out. But with that in mind, our airplane doesn't care about true or indicated altitude. It cares about pressure altitude, because at high pressure altitudes, our airplane doesn't perform as well, and here's why. As you may remember from our lesson on weather and the atmosphere, the higher we go, the less air pressure there is. So at high pressure altitude, there is less air. Don't let this confuse you because it's really not the best verbiage and it confuses everyone at first. High pressure altitude means that we're higher up in the atmosphere and there's less air pressure up there. But just remember, pressure altitude is the height we are in feet above a specific air pressure of 29.92 inches. This specific air pressure is called the standard datum plane and this is almost never the actual altitude you're flying at. So why does this low pressure that we find at high pressure altitudes hurt the performance of our airplane? Well, there's actually a few reasons. 
First, in order to create power, your engine needs fuel, air, and a spark, or heat. As we climb to higher pressure altitudes, there's less air up there to mix with the fuel to create power. Now, we can lean out the fuel as we climb higher, which will give us a good fuel to air ratio, and this will give us the most power possible, but the more air we have, the more power we can produce. That's why some engines have turbochargers or superchargers. Those devices actually introduce more air into the engine. But the airplane you're flying probably doesn't have either one of those. But it's something to think about because we can produce more power at lower pressure altitudes where there are more air molecules. Next, our wings need air molecules flowing over and under the wings to create lift. At higher pressure altitudes, there are fewer air molecules going over the wings, so your wings can't produce as much lift. Because of this, you're going to notice that it's a lot harder to climb in areas of high pressure altitude. Now, it is true that there is less drag on the airplane, so it is possible to travel faster through the air around you, as long as your engine is able to produce enough thrust to do that. Last but not least, the high pressure altitude affects our propeller. There's less air up at high pressure altitudes for the propeller to push the airplane forward. I like to say that the propeller can't get quite as much bite on the air when the air is thinner at these higher altitudes. But no matter what the case, now you're starting to see why the thinner air decreases our performance. Now that you understand what pressure altitude is, now we need to know how to calculate it because pressure altitude is the starting point for all our performance calculations. And there are actually four ways we can calculate pressure altitude. The first and most accurate method is to use a flight computer like this. But I'm not going to explain how to use one of these in this video because there are so many different types. But these new digital flight computers are a great way to make these calculations. You just have to lug one around everywhere you go. The next method is really easy, but you have to be in the airplane to use it. All you have to do is set 29.92 inches into the Colesman window on your altimeter. And whatever altitude you see in there is your pressure altitude. This might not be super handy for pre-flight calculations, but you might find this useful at times in the aircraft. Next is my favorite method because you don't need any special tools to use it. All you have to do is take the current altimeter setting at your local field and subtract it from the standard altimeter setting of 29.92. Let's say the current altimeter setting is 30.20. If we subtract that from 29.92 inches, we get negative 0.28. Now we simply multiply this times 1,000 because we lose an inch of mercury every 1,000 feet. So that gives us negative 280 feet. If our field elevation was 3,000 feet MSL, we subtract 280 from that to get a pressure altitude of 2,720 feet. What if our altimeter setting was 28.72? Well, in this case, all we'd need to do is subtract this from 29.92, just like we did before. But this time, we get a positive 1.2. So we'll multiply that times 1,000 to give us 1,200. So if our field elevation was 3,000 feet, we just add 1,200 to that. So in this example, our pressure altitude is 4,200 feet. One word of caution if you use this method, though. Most instructors will agree that using this method is plenty accurate for almost all performance calculations, but technically this isn't the most accurate method since pressure doesn't actually drop exactly one inch of mercury every thousand feet. As you can see from this chart, it's not quite an inch every thousand feet. And by looking at this, you can also see that higher air pressure like this decreases our pressure altitude, and lower air pressure like you see up here increases our pressure altitude. Now you're starting to see why people get confused. Pressure altitude isn't the best name, but that's what we call it. And speaking of that, this chart is another way to find your pressure altitude. This is what we call a pressure altitude conversion chart. This is one of the easiest ways to calculate pressure altitude, and on the written test, this method is what you need to use, because this is going to give you the best answer for the test questions. Sometimes you'll find this chart in the performance section of newer POHs too. So you might like this method if you keep this chart in a handy spot for future reference. Let's say the field elevation is 1,000 feet MSL and the altimeter setting is 30.80. All we need to do to use this chart is to look over here at the altimeter setting on the side and look at the number next to it. In this example, our altitude is negative 803 feet, so all we have to do is subtract 803 from our field elevation of 1,000 feet. So our pressure altitude in this example is 197 feet. 
Okay, so now that we know how to do that, we need to take a look at one of the other four H's that decrease the performance of our airplane, hot. Now, I know you're thinking I'm referring to my great looks, but I'm actually referring to hot outside air temperature. And the reason that hot outside air temperature affects the performance of our airplane is because when the air temperature is hotter, the air molecules actually spread apart. When the air molecules spread apart, the air gets less dense or thinner. And that literally means that there's less air for the engine to take in and less air for our wings to create lift and less air for our propeller to create thrust. It's literally the same reason why our performance is bad at high pressure altitude. Basically, the air is thinner. And because that temperature can affect our performance, just like pressure altitude, we want to take that into account when we calculate performance. To do that, we start with our pressure altitude. Pressure altitude is always going to be the starting point for all our performance calculations. Then, if the temperature is standard, which is 15 degrees Celsius, you're typically going to get the best performance out of your airplane. But if it's hotter than that, your pressure altitude may stay the same, but your airplane thinks it's at a higher altitude because there's less air pressure. And while your actual altitude may not have changed, your airplane's performance is going to get worse because it's at a higher density altitude. Density altitude is the altitude your airplane thinks it's at. Your airplane only cares about the air pressure around it. If the air pressure is lower than the standard pressure, your pressure altitude is going to be higher because there's less air pressure up there. And if the temperature is hotter than standard temperature, your density altitude is going to be higher because there's also less air pressure because those air molecules spreading apart from the heat. But how do we calculate density altitude? Well, we start with our pressure altitude. Pressure altitude is always the starting point for all our performance calculations. Just keep in mind, when the temperature is standard, which is 15 degrees Celsius, density altitude and pressure altitude are exactly the same which means that if temperature is standard and the air pressure is standard, or 29.92 inches, density altitude and true altitude are the same as well. And by the way, sometimes you'll see this weird acronym ISA on some of your charts. That just stands for International Standard Atmosphere. Basically, all this is is a fancy way of saying 15 degrees Celsius or a pressure setting of 29.92. I don't know why they do this, but it's something to watch out for. Now, there is one other thing that affects density altitude, and that's humidity. Humidity also pushes those air molecules farther apart, which also decreases the performance of our engine, wings, and propeller, just like the hotter air temperatures. Now, humidity is one of those four things that we talk about that affects the performance of our airplanes, but we don't typically calculate that because the calculations start to get way too complicated. And it doesn't affect performance quite as much as the other three factors, but it's definitely something you want to consider when you're thinking about performance. Okay, so now we know that if our outside air temperature increases above 15 degrees Celsius, our density altitude also increases with that temperature increase. And we can calculate how much it increases a few different ways. The first method is with the flight computer like this. This is a super quick and easy way to get your density altitude. Start with your pressure altitude in this window right here. Let's say our pressure altitude is 3,000 feet. Let's find 3,000 on this inner ring right here. Then we'll find the current outside air temperature on this outer ring here. Let's say it's 25 degrees Celsius and rotate that over to 3,000 feet. Then we can read our density altitude above this arrow in this window here. It looks like our density altitude is 5,000 feet. As you can see, the outside air temperature can have a huge impact on how high the airplane thinks it is. That's why it's so important to know how to do this. The next method is to use a chart like this. This is pretty simple as well, and this is really the method you need to use on the written exam because this is going to get you the closest to the test answer that the FAA is looking for. Start with your temperature down here at the bottom. Once again, let's say our temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Then move up until we hit a pressure altitude of 3,000 feet. Then we just move straight over from there to get a density altitude of about 4,500 feet. As you can see, that's about a 500 foot difference from our flight computer. That's not going to make a huge difference when it comes to calculating performance, but it could be the difference in a right and wrong answer on the written test though. Okay, so now that you know all that, let's briefly talk about the last of the four H's. High, hot, heavy, and humid. Heavy weight is the only thing we haven't talked about. Now this one's kind of common sense because if your airplane weighs more, it's going to be harder to get the airplane off the ground on a takeoff and it's going to be harder to stop the airplane when you're heavy on a landing. If you weigh more, your wings have to create more lift in order to offset that heavy weight. 
and the propeller has to create more thrust to pull the weight forward. Like I said, all this is common sense, so I'm not going to really explain it any more today. But you'll see in a minute how big of a difference the weight of your airplane makes for takeoff and landing distances. Alright, before we move on, let's take a quick look at the relationship between all these things so I know for sure you have a good understanding of all this when you go to make your calculations. When we're talking about performance, we need to start with the field elevation. This is going to be shown in true altitude. Or we could also start with a cruise altitude if we wanted, and this would be an indicated altitude. From these, we can convert to pressure altitude by accounting for non-standard air pressure, like we talked about earlier. Because remember, pressure isn't always exactly 29.92 inches at sea level every day. But the pressure altitude is our distance above 29.92 inches, not necessarily the pressure that day. From there, we can get our density altitude by accounting for non-standard temperature. If the temperature is exactly 15 degrees, pressure altitude and density altitude are the same. If the temperature is below 15, the density altitude will be below the pressure altitude. And if it's above 15 degrees, then the density altitude will be higher than the PA. And now that you know that, and how the four H's affect performance, let's start making some actual calculations so you know with absolute certainty that you're going to be safe when you go fly. The first calculations you need to know how to make are takeoff calculations. Do I have enough runway to make the takeoff, or am I going to go off the end of the runway before I get airborne? To figure that out, we need to look at the Pilot's Operating Handbook, or POH, for our airplane. In newer POHs, the performance section will be in Section 5, so if you have a paperback version of your POH, I would really recommend tabbing that section out. Now, in the POH, you're typically going to find tables like this to calculate performance, but for the written test, they're going to give you this evil-looking spaghetti chart right here. I'm sorry if you need to change out your underwear after seeing this thing, but I promise you that it's not nearly as bad as it looks. It's actually really simple, and what they're going to do is they're going to give you the current weather situation, and they're going to ask you how much runway you need to take off in these conditions. Alright, so let's start with our temperature. Let's say that once again it's 25 degrees Celsius outside, and our pressure altitude is 3,000 feet. Start down here at the bottom and move straight up until we hit a pressure altitude of 3,000 feet. Notice, there isn't a 3,000 foot mark on this chart, we kind of have to estimate where that is. These lines indicating pressure altitude aren't perfectly straight. We kind of have to imagine where another curved line would be. In this case, the curved line would be halfway between the 2,000 foot and the 4,000 foot mark. So this is where we'll stop our line going up. Then we'll move straight over from there until we hit one of these reference lines. Now, this time we got really lucky because we hit our reference line right on one of these black guidelines. This makes things really easy when this happens. All we need to do is follow this guideline until the guideline hits our weight. In this example, our weight is 2,500 pounds, so we'll stop it right here. But if your previous line hit a spot somewhere between these guidelines, you just kind of have to estimate where that should be by staying the same distance between two guidelines above and below your current numbers. Then, once you hit your weight, you'd move straight over from there until you hit the next reference line. Okay, so I'll move straight over from here, and this time I'm hitting my reference line just barely under one of these guidelines. But wait a second! We've got two sets of guidelines here. I've got these hatch guidelines and these solid guidelines. Don't worry, just look at the labels. The hatch lines are for a tailwind and the solid lines are for a headwind. Let's take a quick peek at the end of the chart. Notice that anytime we move up the chart, our takeoff distance increases, and anytime we move down the chart, our takeoff distance decreases. So as you can see, if we have a headwind, we don't need quite as much runway on a takeoff. And now you can also see how much our weight affects our takeoff distance. And you can see that the temperature and pressure altitude have a tremendous effect on it as well. But anyway, let's get back to this chart. Let's say we have a headwind of 10 knots this time. So we'll stay just below this guideline until we hit a headwind of 10 knots. Then we'll move straight over to the next reference line. Okay, now we've got a decision to make. Is there an obstacle at the end of the runway that we need to clear? It's not uncommon for there to be a tree or something at the end of the runway at some airports. And we obviously don't want to hit that thing. If you do, I don't want to be your instructor. But anyway, what this chart does is it artificially lengthens the amount of runway that we need, so we're airborne before we get to the tree, so we'll be well above the tree by the time we get there. Now, we'll discuss this more when we talk about short field takeoffs, but it's super important that we climb out at VX once we're airborne if we're going to do this. This takeoff distance is calculated based on the assumption that you're going to be climbing out at VX. 
and if you're climbing out at VY instead, you may not have artificially shortened your runway enough to clear the obstacle. Anyway, if you don't have an obstacle, all you need to do is move straight across this chart to the end. It looks like in this example, we need 760 feet of runway. But if I had a 30 foot obstacle to clear, then I want to stay about the same distance in between these two guidelines and move up the chart until I hit my 30 feet. Then move straight across from there to see that I need 1,150 feet of runway. Now on the written test, this is what you want to do. But if you need to do this in real life for an obstacle, I highly recommend just moving all the way up the chart until you hit the 50 foot obstacle mark. And if you do that, you can see that you need closer to 1,300 feet of runway. Now, this is a good time to talk about this because the book answer that you're going to be calculating on the written exam is not always the best answer when you start making these calculations for flight. Take a look at this note in the chart supplement for the airport over at Calico Rock. They tell us that the threshold crossing height, or TCH, is 29 feet for some trees at the end of the runway. Let's call it 30 feet to be safe. The big question is, when was that tree measured? And did they even measure it, or is that just a big fat guess? Also, these distance calculations you see in the POH were numbers that the manufacturer came up with when the aircraft was brand new. If you're flying a 50-year-old airplane like I regularly do, it's a good idea to give yourself a safety buffer because the old girl probably doesn't fly quite like she used to. Another thing you need to consider is your abilities as a pilot. When the manufacturer came up with these numbers, they used a test pilot who probably had thousands of hours worth of experience, and they probably had an unlimited number of attempts to get the best possible performance out of the airplane. So unless you're Chuck Yeager Jr., you may consider adding a little bit of a safety buffer for this as well. Now that I've shown you how to calculate takeoff distance with this stupid spaghetti chart for the written exam, let's take a look at how to make these calculations from an actual POH. You're more likely to use a takeoff table like this when you're making real calculations. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that now. Okay, before we start doing anything, it's really important that you're flying the airplane according to these conditions mentioned at the top of the chart. Otherwise, the takeoff information this thing's giving us is not going to be accurate. For example, if you want to get accurate numbers, it's really important that we're at or below this takeoff weight of 2,200 pounds. If we're above this weight, we need to make sure that we find the appropriate chart for that weight or lower the takeoff weight somehow. Now notice that this thing says that we're going to need to take off with 10 degrees of flaps and we need to start with full power prior to brake release. Now, you might not know what the significance of this is yet unless you're farther along in your training, but these conditions let us know that we need to use short field takeoff procedures if we want the runway length to be accurate. If you do a normal takeoff, you'll need more runway than this chart tells you, but we don't know exactly how much. That's one thing I really don't like about this Cessna 172 Sierra POH. If the Federal Aviation Regulations require you to know the takeoff distance every time you go fly, they should really include a normal takeoff distance chart in here as well. My personal recommendation is to double the takeoff distance from this chart if you're going to use normal takeoff procedures just to be safe. And if you're below those numbers, I would use short field takeoff procedures on your takeoff. Then you'll know for sure the exact amount of runway you need. Anyway, this is something to watch out for because this takeoff table in the POH from my Cessna 172 hotel shows the flaps up for takeoff. And it doesn't specify that you have to use short field takeoff procedures. But if you're ever close on your numbers, I would highly recommend that you err on the side of caution and use short field takeoff procedures. They aren't that difficult to do. Anyway, let's go back to our Cessna 172 Sierra takeoff chart. And let's say we're going to use short field takeoff procedures. Okay, the temperature today is 20 degrees Celsius and our pressure altitude is 3,000 feet. Now we can see here that our ground roll is 925 feet, but our total takeoff distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle is 1,570 feet. Pretty simple. But let's take a quick look at these notes down here at the bottom to make sure there's something we're not forgetting. Okay, so for taking off from a field with an elevation of over 3,000 feet, we need to make sure that we lean the mixture out properly. Remember, if we don't do that, we're not going to get the best power out of our engine because the air is thinner at higher altitudes and we want to get the most power out of our engine, even though we're not going to get 100% power at this altitude. All right, next, this note says we can decrease our takeoff distance by 10% for every 9 knots of headwind. Let's say we have a headwind of 9 knots. 
Usually, I'll just select not to do this to give myself a little bit of a safety buffer. But if we were in a pinch, we could multiply 0.1 times our ground roll of 925 feet to see that a 9 knot headwind would allow us to take off 92.5 feet sooner. Then we have this note right here that basically says that we need more runway if we're taking off on dry grass. This is because grass creates a ton of drag. Now this doesn't really apply in our case, but it's something to keep in mind. Okay, okay, I got a little lucky this time. My temperature and pressure altitude was perfect for this chart. And more than likely, this is never going to happen. Let's say the outside air temperature is 25 degrees and our pressure altitude is 3,500. Now what? Well, we can do one of two things. Sometimes when I'm in a pinch, I'll round up to the next higher temperature and the next higher pressure altitude to give me a worst case scenario takeoff distance. In this situation, I have a ground roll of 1,090 feet and I would need 1,855 feet in order to clear a 50 foot obstacle. This is ultra conservative and this is totally legal. But if you need something a little more precise because you're really close on your numbers, you can interpolate between these two sections. There are a couple ways you can do this, but I'll show you the easiest way to do it. Let's say this time we want to know our takeoff ground roll. We're really not concerned about an obstacle this time. So let's take our takeoff distance from our best case scenario first. That would be this 20 degree line because 20 is the next column below 25 degrees. Then we'll find 3,000 foot line because 3,000 feet pressure altitude is the next row underneath a pressure altitude of 3,500. Okay, so this line gives us a ground roll of 925 feet. Now let's find the worst case scenario. The next temperature column above 25 degrees is 30 and the pressure altitude above 3,500 is 4,000. So let's move down these to see that in a worst case scenario, we need to take off ground roll of 1,090 feet of runway. Now because 25 is exactly halfway between 20 and 30, and 3,500 is exactly halfway between 3,000 and 4,000, if we average out our two takeoff distances, we can get a pretty accurate ground roll. To do that, all we have to do is add 925 and 1,090 for a total of 2,015. Then divide that by 2 to get a ground roll of 1,007.5 feet. Now, once again, this is only accurate if the numbers fall perfectly between these two numbers on the chart. If they're a little to one side or another, you could use this interpolation formula if you want. But as you can see, that is entirely too much work. If you are more than halfway between these numbers, I would just recommend using the higher of these two charts and going with those numbers. But remember, these numbers were made by a test pilot, so it's not going to hurt to have a safety buffer and just use those higher numbers. Now, there are apps that will interpolate for you very quickly and accurately, and you can use one of those if you want for pre-flight calculations, but that's not really going to help you on the written test. And once again, I'd just rather round up to the nearest chart to be safe. Interpolating these numbers literally only gave us 82.5 additional feet. And personally, that's way too close for comfort for me. Okay, now let's take a look at the landing charts so you know for a fact you're going to have enough runway when we come in for a landing. Typically, you'll find that most airplanes need less runway to land than they do for a takeoff, but you still need to know how to find these numbers. Good grief, another stupid spaghetti chart? Yeah, sorry, the FAA wants to know for sure that you're going to know how to use one of these. But don't worry, I won't spend too much time explaining this one because it works just like the takeoff chart. Notice, just like the takeoff chart, there's some conditions we need to meet if we want the numbers on the chart to be accurate with the numbers we actually need. For one, they're assuming that you're going to be carrying some power down final, and they're also assuming that you're going to have all your flaps down. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you probably remember a video I made a few months ago talking about this in excruciating detail. If you haven't watched that yet, you're going to love that video. I highly recommend it. Anyway, if you land with flaps up, you're completely invalidating your landing data, and the runway length you calculate at the end here is not going to be correct. That's why it's so important that we follow these conditions very carefully on these charts, especially when we know that landing distance is a factor. And notice, there are a few other conditions we need to meet as well if we want our calculations to be accurate, including landing at the appropriate indicated airspeed. If you're that guy who's constantly fast when you're crossing the threshold, that landing distance you see here at the end will be wrong. Okay, so let's say our outside air temperature today is 5 degrees Celsius and our PA is 2,000 feet. Let's move up from 5 degrees until we hit our 2,000 foot guideline. 
Then we'll move over until we hit our next reference line. And our weight today is 2,400 pounds, so let's stay in between these two guidelines at roughly the same interval and continue down until we hit 2,400 pounds. Once we're there, let's move straight over to the next reference line. Now, as you know, we should not normally be landing with the tailwind, but let's say we are this time so you can see how much it affects our landing distance. Let's say we're landing with a 10 knot tailwind. So we'll move up the chart here until we hit our 10 knot line, then move straight over from here to the next reference line. Now check out how much this landing distance a 10 knot tailwind adds in this example. 500 feet. Yeah, that's insane, isn't it? I've actually made a lot of tailwind landings, and if you ever make one, you'll notice a tremendous difference in the distance that the airplane floats before you touch down. And your ground speed is also way faster because you're traveling over the ground 10 knots faster. And this makes it harder to get the airplane stopped. Okay, so now you can see that we have an obstacle section on this chart as well, because obstacles can affect our landing distance as well. If we're not landing over an obstacle, we just move straight across the chart like we did in the takeoff chart. And it looks like we need 1,470 feet of ground roll. And notice how they use the term ground roll instead of the term landing distance. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Ground roll means the distance after you touch down all the way until your stopping point. It does not include the runway length you cover during the round out and flare. This is why I like to use the threshold as my aim point when I'm landing on a short runway instead of the captain's bars. Unless I have a crazy tailwind or I make a big mistake, I know for a fact I'm going to land between two and 300 feet beyond that point. So for my personal calculations, I'll typically add 300 feet to my ground roll required to account for that and to give me a total landing distance. If you're new, you might like to add 500 feet or more to be safe and account for this. However, they're most likely not going to want you to do this on the written test. They're only going to want you to find your ground roll or the landing distance over an obstacle. And that raises a good point. What if we're landing over an obstacle? Well, typically this increases your landing distance because you have to plan on shifting your aim point further down the runway to miss the obstacle. There are ways to keep from doing this, like a forward slip, but I would never recommend that you disregard that additional landing distance just because you know a trick for getting down to the runway sooner. So let's see how much runway I would need if there's a 50 foot obstacle at the approach end of a runway. Let's see, I'd say that's exactly 2,200 feet. Yes, I know it seems long, but remember we have a 10 knot tailwind. If we landed the other direction, that would turn that 10 knot tailwind into a 10 knot headwind. And you can see that this alone would reduce our landing distance by almost a thousand feet. Now, you're starting to see why we like to land into the wind. Now, on the written exam, they may also ask you questions with a landing distance table like this. And once again, this type of chart is much more common in small airplanes than a spaghetti chart. And this one is so similar to the table from the Cessna 172 Sierra POH that I'm just going to use this one from the POH so you don't get used to seeing all those pretty colors. I'd hate for you to expect everything in flying to be color coded for you. And if you didn't notice that this chart was color coded, you may want to get your color vision checked because a color blindness diagnosis can really come out of the blue. Anyway, just like our takeoff distance table, we have conditions that we need to meet in order to know for sure that these numbers are accurate. As you can see here, we need to have 30 degrees of flaps in, we need to have the power at idle on touchdown, and we need to use maximum braking. Also, this data is for a paved level dry runway, and this chart is for zero wind. As you can see in the notes here, if we have a headwind, we can decrease our landing distance by 10% for every 9 knots of headwind. And check this out, every 2 knots of tailwind adds 10%. That's insane. That's why it's super important to land into the wind if your runway required is close to the runway distance you have available. In addition to all that, at 50 feet, we need to be at 61 knots. Now this raises a good point that we don't talk about too often. First, if we're faster than 61 knots at 50 feet, our landing distance is going to be longer than what we see here. But what about once we're below 50 feet? This chart actually assumes that you will slow below your landing speed as you cross the threshold. Now I want to be careful about how I say this because some dingleberry is going to take this the wrong way and stall their plane right before they make the runway. But when you start the round out, your airspeed should start to gradually decrease all the way until you touch down. If you're struggling with floating landings, it's a good chance that this is your problem. You're waiting too long to start slowing down. And last but not least, if we want to make sure these numbers are accurate, 
we need to make sure that we're using the short field landing procedures appropriately. Okay, let's go ahead and calculate our landing distance. Let's say we weigh 2,550 pounds this time. Our outside air temperature is 14 degrees Celsius and our pressure altitude is 4,300 feet. Okay, well, 15 degrees is the exact middle of 10 and 20 degrees, and 14 degrees is slightly below that. And 4,500 is the exact middle of 4,000 and 5,000 feet, so if we interpolate between these two charts using the average method, our runway length won't be perfect, but we know for a fact that the length that this gives us will be slightly high. And that's conservative, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so 10 degrees and 4,000 feet gives us a ground roll of 655 feet and a landing distance over a 50-foot obstacle of 1,460 feet. 20 degrees and 5,000 feet gives us a 705-foot ground roll and a 1,535-foot landing distance over an obstacle. Let's say we're landing over an obstacle today. So let's add 1,460 and 1,535 for a total of 2,995. Then divide that by 2 to see that we need 1,497.5 feet of runway. Now, remember, this number isn't perfect because technically this isn't right in the middle of these two charts. But our numbers are legal and conservative because with our conditions, we actually need a little less runway than what we see here. With that in mind, if my temperature was 16 degrees and my pressure altitude was 4,600, I would use this ground roll of 705 feet and the obstacle landing distance of 1,535 feet. And I wouldn't even consider landing on anything shorter than that. The only exception to that would be if we had a headwind of 9 knots or more. Then we could shorten it the same way we did the takeoff distance. Now check this out. This note says that we should increase our ground roll distance if we're landing on a dry grass runway. And believe me, the word dry here is super important. I about had to clean my pants out one time because I landed on a short grass runway that was covered in dew. It's probably more like 50 or 60% on a wet grass runway. I wish they'd throw that information in these POHs. That would be really nice to know. Anyway, so if we take our ground roll of 705 feet and we multiply that times 0.45, that grass increases our landing distance another 317.25 feet. And this gives us a total landing distance of 1,022.25 feet. Now, I know this seems kind of weird because grass adds drag on a landing, but the reason why grass landings add so much distance is because most pilots tend to add a little power right before touchdown. And we also try to avoid brakes as much as possible to keep our nose wheel from digging into the dirt. Okay, let's talk about a few more things that you need to know when it comes to performance. First, let's spend a few minutes talking about crosswind charts. Now in some aircraft POHs, you'll find that the airplane may be limited on how strong of a crosswind you can take off or land in. But in a lot of airplane POHs, you'll find something like this that was obviously written by a lawyer. In this POH, it says the maximum allowable crosswind velocity is dependent on the pilot capability as well as airplane limitations. Operation in direct crosswinds of 15 knots has been demonstrated. Basically, they're saying that if you land with a crosswind component more than 15 knots, you're a test pilot at that point. Now, it doesn't say you can't, but I would highly recommend against it until you get a lot more skill under your belt and you become extremely familiar with that aircraft. So for the time being, let's say that we can't land with a crosswind component of more than 15 knots in this airplane. But how do we know if we have a 15 knot crosswind component? The wind is almost never going to be a straight 90 degree crosswind. And that means that we have to make some calculations. And if we have a quartering headwind, we might also need to know how strong our headwind component is. Because remember, if it's 9 knots or more on this airplane, that will actually shorten our takeoff and landing distance, and we might want to know that. Okay, so let's say we're landing on runway 36 and we have winds from 320 at 30 knots. Are we going to exceed our crosswind component limit of 15 knots? When you go to take your written exam, you're going to need to use this chart right here. But in a minute, I'll show you a simple way that you can figure this out in your head without digging out this stupid little chart. So you can focus on flying the airplane and not fumbling for this chart when you need to focus on landing. Okay, anyway, the first thing we need to do is find the difference between the wind direction and the runway heading. To do that, I'll just subtract 320 from our runway heading of 360 for runway 36. So it looks like we have a wind angle of 40 degrees. Okay, now all we have to do is find 40 degrees out here and move in till we hit our wind speed of 30 knots. 
Okay, now we can read our headwind component over here. And if you look closely at this chart, you can tell that our headwind component is almost exactly 23 knots, maybe a tiny bit over that. And if we wanted, we could actually use this headwind component to reduce our takeoff and landing distances, like I mentioned a second ago. And if you remember, our chart said we could reduce our distances by 10% for every nine knots of headwind. So we could actually reduce our runway distance required by 20% if we wanted. Anyway, now we can move straight down the chart to see our crosswind component. Looks like our crosswind component is just over 19 knots, which is beyond our 15 knot limit. So we really need to find another runway. But as you can see, this chart is super easy to use. Okay, before we move on, I want to show you another way you could get asked this on the written test because I don't want the FAA getting the best of you. What is the maximum wind velocity for your aircraft if the winds are at a 50 degree angle off the runway and your airplane's crosswind limit is 20 knots? Don't let this confuse you. All you have to do is run the chart backwards. We know that 20 knots is our crosswind limit. So let's move up from 20 knots on the crosswind component axis and move up until we hit our 50 degree line. From here, we kind of have to imagine where our wind velocity circle is. I would say it's about 26 knots. So if our wind velocity is 26 knots or more, and our wind really is 50 degrees or more off the runway heading, we need to find another runway. Okay, now I'm going to show you a method that's actually useful in the airplane. It's called the clock method, and this is going to keep you from digging out this stupid little chart when you really need to focus on flying the airplane. I like my students looking outside and not at these tiny little crosswind charts when they're trying to land the plane. To use this method, imagine an old-fashioned analog clock. Now, let's let every hour on the clock represent 5 degrees of wind angle from the runway. At the 3 o'clock position, which is 15 degrees off the runway, we'll take a quarter of the wind velocity. At 6 o'clock, or 30 degrees off the runway, we'll take half of the wind velocity. At 9 o'clock, or 45 degrees off the runway, we'll take 3 quarters of the wind velocity. And at 12 o'clock, or 60 degrees, we'll take all of it. And obviously, if the winds are straight down the pipe, we won't have a crosswind component. All right, now that you know all that, let's try it out. Let's say we're landing on runway 15 and the winds are 135 at 15 knots. First, we'll find our wind angle by subtracting 135 degrees from 150. That gives us a wind angle of 15 degrees. Okay, so 15 degrees is at our three o'clock position, and we said that we're taking a quarter of the wind velocity there. So our crosswind component is exactly 3.75 knots. Not too bad. That's barely even a crosswind. Let's do another one. But this time, let's say they give us this picture here and tell us the winds are 045 at 28 knots. Which runway should we use? Are we gonna be able to land the plane here if our airplane's max crosswind component is 20 knots? Pause the video if you think you can solve this one on your own, and I'll show you my calculations once you're done. Okay, how many people did I get with this one? Runway 22 and runway 04 are closed. So the only runways available are runway 36 and 18. But just for fun, we'll take a look at the crosswind on both of them. Okay, so runway 18 and 22 are definitely out of the picture because we have a tailwind on those runways. But if we subtract 40 for runway 4 from the wind direction of 045, you can see that our wind angle is 5 degrees. Then for runway 36, that one's easy because 45 degrees is 45 degrees off from that one. Okay, let's start with the clock method, then we'll compare the results with the crosswind component chart. Let's see, runway 04 is 5 degrees off and the wind speed is 28 knots. 5 degrees is closest to the 12 o'clock position, and if the winds are straight down the pipe, we don't have a crosswind component. So let's call our crosswind zero knots. Now let's use the chart and see what the difference is. Let's find five degrees on the chart and move down till we hit a wind speed of 28 knots. Then we'll move down the chart from there until we hit our crosswind component scale. Looks like our crosswind is exactly two knots. I'd say the clock method is close enough in this case, wouldn't you? Okay, so now let's try runway 36. Okay, so our angle off is 45 degrees and that's at the nine o'clock position. So let's take three quarters of the wind speed to get our crosswind component. Three quarters of 28 is exactly 21. So according to the clock method, our crosswind component is 21 knots. And this is just over our 20 knot crosswind limit. Let's try the chart just to be sure. I'll start here on the 45 degree line and move down till we hit 28 knots. Then move straight down from there. I'm getting somewhere between 20 and 21 knot crosswind component. So in reality, since runway four is closed, we should be finding another airport to land at. This is why you need to learn how to divert to another airfield, and I hope to discuss this in a future video. But once again, if this 20 knot limit is a maximum demonstrated limit and not a do not exceed number,
and you've been flying for a while and you're comfortable giving it a shot, you can always give it a try and worst case, you can always go around if you need to. Okay, so let's talk about something else that affects the performance of our aircraft for a minute. Drag. Now I've briefly discussed this in some of my earlier aerodynamic videos, but it's really important to bring this up when you're talking about performance. As you may remember, our airplane needs to create lift in order to fly. And the way it does that is by getting air to flow over and under the wings. Now if there isn't a lot of air flowing over the wings because the airplane is moving too slowly, the wings need to be at a higher angle of attack in order to maintain level flight, and an even higher angle of attack in order to climb. Well what does that mean? It means that we're also producing more drag at slow air speeds because we're at higher angles of attack. And you'll notice that when you're flying faster, the nose of the airplane will be lower when you're trying to maintain altitude and even while you're climbing. In fact, in some airplanes, when you're flying at high airspeeds, your nose will actually be below the horizon just to maintain level flight. This drag that is a result of the lift that our airplane is producing is called induced drag. We are inducing the drag as a byproduct of the lift that we're creating. And as you can see from this chart, our induced drag decreases as we speed up. But what happens when you stick your hand out of the window of a car? The faster you're going, the more the wind rips your hand back. And that's why all the little parts and pieces on the airplane get caught in this wind flow and try holding the airplane back just like your hand. This is what we call parasite drag. And as we fly faster, parasite drag increases. And if we were to average out the parasite and induced drag, what we would get is this curved line right here. And as you can see, we have this magical little zone right here where we have the least amount of drag on our airplane. We call this little spot LD max, or lift over drag to the max, because this is giving us the best ratio of lift to drag for the airspeed you're flying. Okay, so who cares? Well, oddly enough, a lot of airspeeds on your airplane are directly related to this airspeed at which LD max occurs. If you want to get the best fuel efficiency or best range on your airplane, typically it's right in this area where you have the least amount of drag. If you're making an emergency descent, your best glide is going to be right around this spot where there's the least amount of drag on your airplane. What about when we're climbing out on a takeoff? Well, VY is going to be super close to this LD max speed because we want the least amount of drag on our airplane. And this airspeed is going to allow us to climb up to a certain altitude as quickly as possible. But if I wasn't concerned about the time it took me to get up to altitude, and I wanted my wings to create a little more lift, I could increase my angle of attack a little more and climb out at a steeper angle. Yes, I've increased the drag on my airplane, but I've also increased the lift my airplane is producing, and that's a good thing. That's actually what I want if I'm trying to clear an obstacle at the end of the runway. And that's what we're trying to accomplish when we climb out at VX instead of VY. We're basically sacrificing a little bit of speed by inducing more drag and trading it for more lift. In addition to all that, when you're below this LD max number, the way you control the airplane will be a little bit different as well. When we're below LD max, typically the most effective way to speed up is to reduce our angle of attack by pitching down. And power doesn't really speed us up like it should because we have so much drag on the airplane. And we need to get the airplane closer to LD max where there's less drag. We're essentially trading drag for airspeed. That's why during slow flight we use pitch to control our airspeed and power to control our altitude. With that in mind, let's take a quick look at a couple more charts that you should be familiar with. Now, we know that if we climb out at VY, we'll be able to climb out at the best rate. But how fast is that? Well, we can figure that out with a rate of climb chart like this. If the pressure altitude is 4,000 feet and our temperature is 20 degrees, and we're climbing out at VY, we can expect 555 feet per minute. And this is handy because you can use this information to figure out how long it's going to take you to get to your cruise altitude. If I was climbing from 4,000 to 6,000 feet, that's 2,000 feet of climb distance. So I could just divide that by 555 feet per minute to see that it's going to take me 3.6 minutes to get up there. That's about 3 minutes and 36 seconds. Okay, here's a couple other charts that I've explained in detail on my cross-country navigation videos. As you can see, these also take the airplane's weight, the pressure altitude, and the outside air temperature into account to give you accurate performance numbers so you can calculate your time, fuel, and distance. Because these are things you're going to want to know when you start flying cross-country. Now, I know there's a lot of information in today's episode, but if you can remember anything from today's video, remember the four H's. High, hot, heavy, and humid.
If I'm operating at a high pressure altitude, if it's hot outside, if it's humid outside, or if my airplane is super heavy, I'm not going to get the performance I'm used to. If I don't have enough runway in front of me, my best option is probably to wait for the temperature to cool down. Leaving gear or passengers behind is an option as well if you want to reduce your weight, especially if it's someone you don't like. But that might not be a realistic option in some cases, especially if it's your mother-in-law. Now, as we discussed, a headwind can be a tremendous help as well. But as you know, the wind is susceptible to change. So I would just be careful using it to help your numbers, but I would always count on it if it looks like it's gonna hurt your numbers. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I hope you learned something. In my next video, I'm gonna start digging into the regulations you need to know as a private pilot. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that video because you need to know the information, and I promise I'll make it fun. And when I finish with that video, I'll throw it right here. Or if you wanna take a break from studying a bit and you wanna enjoy some flying, try this video. Enjoy the flight. Sit. Bro, you're not gonna believe this. I just bought a free pilot training. I'm gonna keep on watching.